the, for those who have just joined, uh, we will get started in about another minute or two. Thank you. Hello and welcome to our event today. Uh, my name is Rosa and I am joined today by my colleagues, Susan Collins and Isaac Farley. To reduce background noise, we have everyone muted. If you have any questions during the seminar, you can write them in the chat or in the question and answer box and we will answer you there. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to use um, the Q&A box because it makes it easier for us to know which questions have been answered. The webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording later in a few days along with the presentation slides. So here is our agenda for the day. Um, uh, today we will talk about content registration, our services, our participation reports tool, and how you can get help. Uh, there will be a break and during that time we will answer questions in the Q&A and also at the end of the seminar. So first, I'll give a bit of an introduction to Crossref. Crossref is not just about DOIs. We are not defined by a particular service, but by how we fit into the scholarly community as a whole. And this is our mission. A little bit about us. So this is a picture from a Crossref team meeting back in May 2019 in, May, in Maine. Crossref was founded in 2000 with 12 publisher organizations. We now have over 14,000. We are a not-for-profit membership organization made up of 40 staff based primarily in Oxford, UK, Boston, USA, as well as some staff working remotely in France, um, Los Angeles, London, Tulsa, and New York. So we're not as big an organization as you might have thought. You can also check out crossref.org forward slash people where you can learn more about our roles. We have advisory groups to get input and advice from our members for established services and or content types. So for example, some advisory groups would be for books, similarity check, crossmark, funder registry, and event data. We have a 16 member board, which represents our diverse membership. The board is comprised of commercial and nonprofit, open access subscription, and includes representatives of organizations from a range of different countries. One of our truths is, one member, one vote. With that said, I want to mention another very important, very important item. We started elections for our board of directors. Ballots and information uh, was sent to the voting contact of your organization on September 30th. We encourage all eligible members to vote. Your vote is important. Results will be announced at our virtual annual meeting, uh, which will be held on November 10th. We work with a diverse group of members and affiliated organizations, over 14,000 from 125 countries. We now have a metadata store well over 117 million content items, which is growing every day. We offer a wide array of services to ensure that scholarly research metadata is registered, linked, and distributed. When members register their content with us, we collect metadata about that piece of content. We process it so that connections can be made between publications, people, organizations, and other outputs. We preserve the metadata we receive from the scholarly record. 
We make it available across a range of interfaces and formats so that the community can use it and build tools with it. We will be talking you through some of our services later this afternoon. So who uses Crossref? Probably more people than you realize. From publishers and funders to indexing services and data analytics systems use Crossref services and our metadata. The number continues to grow year on year, especially as we expand the content types and related metadata registered with Crossref. The largest group of our members are publishers, and they come in all shapes and sizes, commercial, society, government, university, and libraries, for example. But why do publishers join? To help their content get discovered. Show people where their content is located and update it if it if and when it moves, drive more traffic to publications, turn references into hyperlinks, find out who is using their content, and also to participate in collaborative services. At the end of our first year, we had 51 members and affiliated organizations. In 2012, participation in our sponsoring program began to increase. Sponsors are affiliated organizations that act on behalf of smaller publishers and societies uh, who wish to register their content with Crossref by providing them with technical and language support and also uh, help with billing and services. By last year, we had almost 3,000 new members and affiliated organizations join in just 12 months. Now we've moved away from the word publisher to focus on the word member as not all our members self-associate as publishers nowadays. Um, they create and disseminate content, deposit metadata with Crossref, and are able to vote in our board elections. Members pay an annual fee to Crossref, which is based on their publishing revenue. They also pay deposit fees with all new DOIs. We also work with third-party service providers and metadata users who do not contribute uh, to our metadata store, but make use of it via our API and search interfaces for a variety of different purposes. We'll be going through, um, we'll be going into that in more depth uh, and the uses of metadata later today. Our membership is really growing outside the US, US and Western Europe, which is where our first members came from. We're seeing a new type of audience with different needs and we need to have conversations to figure out uh, what those needs are and how we can meet them. Increased collaboration with community partners is one of those ways. Um, as is increased outreach efforts, such as events like, the, like, like these. As with most organizations, our in-person events are on hold. We hope to be able to resume uh, these next year, focusing on regions where we, we are seeing an increased member growth. In the last three years, we have over 6,000 new members joined from around the world. Uh, the largest areas in terms of growth of new members are in Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe with nearly two thirds of all new members coming from these regions. Nearly one third of these nonprofit organizations, um, uh, around half are, <laughs> apologies, and around half are small publishers with 100 or fewer registered DOIs with Crossref. Uh, that's a lot of metadata being deposited. As our thousands of publisher members register their content with us, we received the milestone of 100 million content items in late 2018, and our metadata store continues to grow exponentially. So uh, our members, are, what are they registering? This is a list of our content types supported by our schema, probably a more diverse list than you would have expected. Our largest type is journal articles, and our newest type is preprints, which although still small is a rapidly growing area. Now this graph gives you a bit uh, more of an idea of the breakdown of content registered with Crossref. Nearly three quarters is journal content, but we are starting to see a growth in a range of other types of content, as well as books, conference proceedings, reports, data sets, and standards. Now, uh, my colleague Susan is going to talk to you about different ways you can register your content with Crossref. Susan? Great, thanks Rosa. Um, and again, welcome to everybody joining us here today. Um, so as Rosa explained, there's a number of different types of content that you can register. And now we're going to kind of take a look at how that actually happens. 
when you're registering content, you're sending Crashlab the metadata of each content item. So we're going to look at the different ways that you can send us the metadata and what exactly needs to be included. But first up, I just a quick note about DOIs. I'm going to talk a lot about them today, but it's important to understand and remember that Crashlab isn't just about DOIs, as Rosa mentioned. We're not defined by a particular service, but how we support the academic community as a whole. Um, and remember, DOIs are not an indicator of the quality of a publication or of the organization that registers them, nor is it a mark of the quality of the research that's presented. Um, a DOI is a persistent link and an identifier for a content item. Okay, so we're gonna first start talking about how you create your DOIs. DOIs are just one of the pieces of metadata that will make up your deposit. So as a member, you're assigned a unique, pre a unique prefix for your account um, in the format of 10 followed by five digits. In some journals, you might see prefixes that have four digits. When it, they originally started, um, prefix had four digits and have had five since 2012. So you may, you may see both out there. Some members will have one publication, some have multiple. And one prefix can be used to register all of your content, even if you publish different types of content, like books and journal articles, for example. If you add a new title or a new publication, there's no need to notify us prior to registering content for that title. Once you begin to register content for that publication, it will be automatically added to your account. Um, and each member has a unique publishing schedule. Um, it could be weekly or monthly, even yearly. Um, and DOIs can be registered at any time. There's no minimum and there's no maximum number which you can deposit. So let's look at a DOI in a little more detail. Um, a DOI is comprised of three sections. So the red part is the resolver address. Um, keeping in mind that each a, a DOI is an identifier, but it's also an actionable link, which means it's a resolvable in a browser. And that's the bit that makes that happen. The blue is a prefix, which we just mentioned. And then the yellow is the suffix, which is the part of the DOI that's assigned by the publisher, and it's unique to each content item. So we receive a lot of questions from new members about advice on how to create their DOIs, um, or specifically the suffix for their DOIs. Um, keeping in mind that a DOI is an opaque identifier, meaning that the DOI itself doesn't necessarily have any meaning, so there isn't really a prescribed formula that you need to follow. Our best advice is that your DOI suffixes should be consistent, simple, and short. Um, consistent and simple for easy management, um, establishing a suffix pattern that's easy to maintain, and short so they don't take up much space when they're used in citations. And again, a DOI suffix doesn't have to state anything about the item that it's identified, that's identifying. It's all done with the metadata that you register with us. When you create your suffix, you can use the letters A through Z and whether they're capital or small letters, they're all recognized the same. Um, you can use the numbers zero through nine in certain characters, such as hyphens or parentheses. Some members like to use the ISSN or the volume and issue numbers, and others will use um, the title abbreviation. So in 2017, we issued new display guidelines for DOIs. And it's really important that all members follow these guidelines for consistency and usability. Crossfit DOI should be displayed in the full URL wherever the bibliographic information about the content is displayed. You'll see um, HTTPS, which is the secure protocol, but you will see older DOIs um, with the older format starting with dx.doi.org. Those older DOIs will continue to resolve just fine. And members are not obligated to change the formatting of existing DOIs, but new DOIs should be in the updated, um, the updated display guidelines. Once your content is registered with Crossref, users are gonna be able to retrieve your identifiers and create links using them. So Crossref DOIs must resolve to either the full text if you provide open access or to a landing page that you maintain. Now the landing page must contain the full bibliographic citation of the article, the DOI displayed as a URL and instructions on how to access the full text. And this might be through a login or through a subscription, for example. Access to the full text is always controlled by the publisher, but the landing page itself must be available to all readers. So when you register your content, you send us the basic bibliographic metadata for each item that you register. And each content type has slightly different metadata specific to that item. 
Um, for journal articles or books, for example, this might include the title or the author, or publication dates, uh, issue numbers, ISSN, ISBN, anything that describes the content that you're registering. We have minimal requirements because we need to support a variety of our members' publication practices. But we do ask that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. The more comprehensive that your metadata is, the more likely that your content will be discovered and disseminated. So we also collect non-bibliographic data um, about the items being registered. And this can include such things as reference lists, funding data, um, ORCIDs, uh, license data, clinical trial information, abstracts, um, and of course the data about relationships between items. If you use our Crossmark service, you could send us information on errata or retractions or updates. Um, and as we add content types, we're always adding more metadata options. So how does all of this metadata get into the Crossref system? There are a number of different tools that are available depending on uh, your technical level. Um, we have members uploading XML files, uh, our manual web deposit form. For folks who use the OJS publishing platform, there's a plugin that sends metadata to Crossref through that. And then also our metadata manager deposit tool. So we're gonna take a look at each one of these individually. So first up, um, all the metadata that comes into our system is ultimately in XML format. Um, we have our own metadata schema for deposits and the schema is a set of rules that defining, define what can be included and in what format. So the schema is fairly rigid, but it's very comprehensive. And some members register their content by creating their own XML, using the schema and uploading the file to our system. Um, the initial XML that you create for content registration must include both metadata and identifiers. Um, the elements need to appear in a particular order, a defined order based on the schema. Um, an example you see here, um, every XML file you send us has member specific information in the header section, um, the email address, which is used to send out notification when your file has been processed. Um, and it also includes, um, this is a journal title deposit, um, Journal metadata, title, ISSN, volume, issue, etc. Um, next, um, so some more XML of a journal article. Um, it has basic metadata like your title, author, publication date, pages, and of course the identifier information. Um, metadata collected for content types will differ, but um, you'll still be able to supply like a title, contributor, publication date for all of them. When your file has been uploaded and it's added to our submission queue, you'll receive a notification that it's been received. And this will be sent to the email address that was included along with the deposit. Most files are processed within a few minutes, but it can get delayed if the, the traffic, the submission traffic is high. So if you submitted something, you don't see it in the log, you can always check to see if your deposit is still in the queue. Once the metadata is submitted, you're going to receive an email that states it's been received and then a message that states if the deposit was successful or if it failed. So if your deposit was processed successfully, you're done. Metadata records in the database, you can start displaying your DOI and linking your content. But if the deposit fails, you're going to need to, receive, to review your logs and correct the errors that are listed on the email. And we'll talk a little bit later about how that happens in, in updating, updating existing metadata. Okay, so not all members are able to generate their own XML. So we have created some alternate, uh, alternative options. First up is the web deposit form, um, which is a manual entry form. It's very basic. You enter your data field by field and it writes and submits the XML in the background, submits it to our system. Um, and you can use this form for journal and book content, uh, conference proceedings and reports. And you don't need to know XML in order to use the form. Um, additionally, the web deposit form can be used for supplemental metadata deposits, um, such as funding and license metadata, and that's sent via a CSV file. So a number of our members publish their journals using the OJS uh, platform. A Public Knowledge Project, or PKP, um, has created a plugin that was built in collaboration with Crossref to help members register their content. Um, PKP does recommend that you um, update to at least OJS version 3.1.2, um, which is so that they can sort of fully support um, instances of that going forward. 
Um, in addition to content registration, um, there's a number of, of specific Crusher plugins that are available using 3.1.2 or later. And these include reference linking and de um, depositing references plugin, funding metadata, and authenticate plugin if you use the similarity check um, service. Um, we're going to talk today just kind of about the content registration DOI plugin. Um, so this is the the page that, ha that contains all of the Crossref or all of the plugins, I should say, under uh, Journal Manager Settings Website Plugins. And the Import Export Plugins, you would find the Crossref XML Export Plugin. You click to the box to the right um, of the DOI plugin description to enable it and click through Settings to configure. And you'll see um, this page here comes up. Um, so when you're setting up the OJS plugin, it's important that you put in the name and email of someone at your organization who's going to be responsible for looking after your deposits um, because information about those deposits will be sent to this person so they can follow up if, if needed. The username and password field are the ones that you would get from Crossref in your welcome email from our member team. If you don't know the login and you need to set up um, your OJS system, you can contact us and we can help you with that information. Um, a thing to keep in mind, though, is though our support team can help you with deposit errors once an article has been sent, we really aren't able to assist you with the plugin setup on OJS. We just don't have access to your OJS instances. PKP has two resources for you to get additional information, and one of them is their forum, um, which you can see the link here, and then also the Crossroads specific PKP documentation. Um, Again, you see the link here, and we'll be sending these slides out so you'll have them as a resource if you need them. Um, next up, um, Isaac is going to talk about our next um, deposit tool, which is our metadata manager. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Rosa. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. So metadata manager is now, now available to use simply by going to crossref.org slash metadata manager, that URL there at the bottom of the, the slide. You can log in using the same, <clears throat> excuse me, the same username and password that you've previously used to log in to our other tools like the web deposit form or the admin tool. Um, and there is a step-by-step -step guide available at uh, crossref.org crossref slash help slash metadata manager if you should have questions uh, as you work on the tool. And I'll put, that in, I'll put that link in the chat so you have it available. Um, also, this will be, they will be on the slides as a follow-up to this. Um, so this is your workspace, this image that's displayed right now, and it will contain your list of publications. The first time you log in, it will be empty until you add your titles. As uh, either Susan or Rosa said, many of our new members uh, who join may only have one journal or a few journals, but we do have members who have dozens, hundreds, thousands of journals. So we decided to not pre-populate Metadata Manager with any journals. So um, when you first use the tool, it will be empty. But you can add titles um, that you would like to manage in Metadata Manager using this um, add existing journal search field in the top left there. Um, you can add those new titles and you can even add existing articles. So you can see on the right side of the screen, this is a picture of how you would add existing articles. So that add existing search field in both the journal workspace uh, and on the homepage um, are ways in which you can add existing content and manage that using Metadata Manager. Thanks. This can be, so Metadata Manager can be used, like I said, to deposit, can only be deposit, can only be used to deposit journal articles. It's the only content type that we currently support. Uh, we may add uh, content types in future versions of the tool. Um, this tool supports our content registration service by offering a simpler, more flexible, um, more attractive user interface um, so that you can register and update metadata. Uh, and it's simpler to use than maybe previous tools that, that you have, may have used like the web deposit form. As you may have seen from some of the screenshots, the tool is still in beta. Uh, so the majority of users, um, when they use Metadata Manager, find the tool to work very well, but we do have a few users 
uh, who have run into problems. If you run into problems, if you encounter problems, please let us know at support at crossref.org. Um, so just a, just a caveat there. So metadata manager is not just about bibliographic metadata. Um, you can, when you first use the tool, you can retrieve titles, as I said, that you have previously registered and add new articles, volumes and issues uh, to that title with ha without having to re-enter the title details. You can also enter meta metadata in all of these fields. So um, references, license information, funding, cross mark, et cetera. Uh, you can do all of that in one go. Um, so that makes the tool a lot more streamlined. Once you click deposit on, a, on an article, we immediately process that deposit and display the results in real time for you. Um, so you can see in this example on your screen, this deposit was accepted. Um, and all of the deposit records that are accepted by the system have a live DOI. Um, all deposits are archived and available for reference on the deposit history tab there in the top middle, um, uh, located up on the top menu bar. In addition, you can register articles for multiple issues in one go, not just one article. So you can, you can register one article or you can register many articles. Um, but the tool works best when you submit 20 or fewer articles at a time. Um, so the best kind of strategy when using Metadata Manager is to separate your submission into smaller chunks. Um, some members like to submit uh, articles for each of their issues. Maybe they have a dozen issues for for each of their there are for each of their issues. They have a dozen articles, so they will submit those dozen at a time um, using Metadata Manager, and that that seems to limit problems with um, excessive uh, numbers of articles in the tool. The article editing uh, form validates the metadata you enter to prevent problems when you submit the article for registration. So we have some front end. Um, validation that goes into some front end checks that go into your metadata uh, and will return errors right on the screen. Um, like we, like I said earlier, this takes all your metadata in one go, references, funding, cross mark, it's comprehensive uh, and processes your deposits immediately. Whatever method of registration you use, it's important that your metadata be accurate. Uh, the information the, the information needs to be the right information. You need to avoid misspelling of author names or bad license URLs, for example. And if your resource resolution URLs, those, those URLs where your DOIs are meant to resolve to are bad or out of date, those need to be updated as well. Um, complete and current metadata are things that we're focusing on at CrossRef always. Uh, we want to make it easy for you to update your metadata, keep track of those updates. Um, and we continue to evolve and refine how we collect uh, and allow you to, to make those edits to your metadata. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how, we, how you can update and add extra metadata. So you, you've gone through the process, you've, you've entered your metadata, you've registered your DOIs with us, um, everything's been successful, you're, you're celebrating a bit, um, down the road you decide, oh, I need, to, I need to make some additions or I need to make some changes. Um, humans make mistakes, there's, there's typos in metadata, um, and sometimes you just wanna come back and add additional bits of metadata as you go. So one, one thing to note is we never charge content registration fees for metadata updates, additions, or corrections. There's, there's absolutely no cost associated with you coming back and making updates to existing metadata. We wanna make sure that your metadata is accurate and up to date, and so there's no, there's no cost associated with that. Um, as I showed you with Metadata Manager, making those corrections, those updates, um, is easier th than ever with that tool for journal articles. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by Crossref metadata. When registering your content, you, our members, supply us with a wide range of metadata, including basic metadata, titles, authors, ISSNs, ISBNs, funding information, license information, and, and maybe even cross mark, ORCID IDs. 
in the context of Crossref, metadata is information about publications, which we then make available for thousands of other parties to use in the tools and services they provide. When people look for your content, they search Crossref not just by the DOI, but also by the author name or the ORCID ID. It helps. It is helpful to register all authors, not just the first author. And the more information that you register, the more metadata that you provide to us, the easier it is for researchers and the community as a whole to find your content. As I said earlier, we, uh, we don't charge for updates um, and metadata is publicly available at no cost uh, to the scholarly community. Um, we do have some exceptions to that, but mostly all forms of the metadata uh, are available uh, to you and to the rest of the community at no cost. So um, that means that this is widely available. Your metadata is widely available to the community. Um, and as I said before, metadata is used by a range of organizations such as funders who want to identify the research, research outputs from their funding, repositories, libraries, um, all who want to enhance their metadata. Um, they may use it in data analytics systems and reference managers. Really anyone who uses scholarly metadata is coming to Crossref. Uh, and again, the, the more you can give us, the better. As I said, it's important to keep your metadata up to date. After registering your content, it's important uh, to make, make changes or updates as needed with us. Sometimes these errors, or, or, or sometimes er, er, there are errors and, and changes need to be made to the, to the metadata. It is important that readers can always find and use the content that is published. Incorrect or outdated metadata will not help researchers find their content. So if you have a change in a URL or an update, Please update that as soon as you can. After registering content, you may encounter an error or need to make a change on your website. Here are some examples of when metadata should be updated. So if you have a correction, if, if, you're, if there's a change on your website or perhaps you're moving uh, platform, platform providers or maybe you're partnering with other, member pub, other publisher members, um, you may need to, to make updates to where your DOIs resolve or the metadata that's uh, in your records. If there is an error or an update in the metadata, it is necessary to send us that correction. So let's talk about how to do that. If, if you only need to update the resource resolution URL where your DOI resolves to, for example, you can send us a CSV file, which includes the DOI and the new URL. And you can you can submit that to us in a list. Our technical support team, myself and others, um, will update all of your records. Uh, so you do not have to do that for each record individually. So we can, we can update um, all, of your, all of your URLs or some of your URLs uh, and, and all we need is in that CSV file format with the DOI and the new URL. Um, a, a, new, a new DOI is, it should never be assigned for existing content. Uh, and there are never changes, uh, and there, uh, excuse me, uh, there is never a charge to update DOIs, which we've talked about. So as I said, mistakes can be made, um, even for the most careful users. We never charge um, those, those fees, like I said, so there should be no cost barrier for getting us the most accurate and thorough metadata as uh, possible and metadata manager makes those corrections for journal articles easier than ever. Um, let's, look at, let's look at how you can discover some of, those, uh, some of those errors and see if there's any in existence. So if you're, if you, if you're doing a, a basic Crossref metadata search, uh, you can use uh, our search interface, search.crossref.org. Uh, it pr presents a segment of the metadata, not everything, um, but it lets you see some basic metadata. Um, so you can search by DOI, ISSN, uh, article title, author, uh, and you can see some of the basic metadata that's been registered for your DOIs. Um, obviously, if you see an error in there, like this one that's displayed on your page, uh, you'll want to work to correct it. In Metadata Manager, the system will display the errors right on the screen for you uh, with a red flag, as you can see in this example. 
These errors will need to be corrected before the deposit is activated. If there are no errors, then the deposit button will be automatically activated. So as I said, Metadata Manager flags those errors to you on the front end. So that's an improvement. Let's talk about editing your metadata. So within Metadata Manager, to review all of the metadata that you have, uh, that you have completed within, within uh, for an article, um, you can do one final check of all the metadata you've entered right before you are about to submit your deposit to us. And that's a really good practice to make sure that you review everything before you submit it to us. Um, so that can be a nice, nice way to, to ensure that that you catch any potential problems. If you're used to using the web deposit form, you know that a redeposit can be tedious. For example, if you find that you've misspelled an author's last name, um, you'd have to manually type in, copy and paste all of that metadata back into the, the web deposit form and then resubmit all of that to us. Um, with Metadata Manager, you can actually go into that specific field or element and make that change right in real time and uh, the process is much simpler and smoother uh, and not as complicated. So the, the full metadata record is retained uh, or imported. Like I said, you can, you can add existing articles into Metadata Manager, and then you can go and correct uh, an, the error specifically in the section um, that, that is problematic. Um, if you've already made a deposit and let's say that it's, um, let's say that it's not a journal article, you can always resubmit the metadata via XML. It will overwrite the old record um, with the new information. As I said, you can use our web deposit form. It just requires you to complete uh, that meta, fill, fill out the, the form in its entirety again. Uh, and then, as I said, with Metadata Manager, you can edit the, the metadata record directly in Metadata Manager. Again, that's only for journal articles. Um, but uh, it's, it's simpler than the other formats. So that's, that's how you can make those changes. So if you, found, if you find that there's a metadata error in an article, which you initially registered a metadata manager, you can locate the article in one of two ways. You can navigate through the list of accepted articles within a given journal, like you see on your screen right here, or uh, in this screen, you can search by the article title in the deposit history. Uh, once you've located the relevant article, you can click on the article title to open the article's metadata record. And from there, you can make the necessary uh, corrections. Um, so, so here you have the record um, opened. And so what you can do is make the necessary correction. You can see in my example on the screen, I've got a uh, it may be a little bit small, but you can see that I've got a, an alert here under contributor that there's a problem. What I can do is expand that contributor, uh, that contributor metadata, make the change uh, within there. Then what I need to do is go click on continue in the top right, and then I can add that to deposit. Um, so what I need to do is actually redeposit that, that article um, with us again to make the change. And you can see when you make that deposit, um, you'll receive the result of your deposit right in the Metadata Manager tool. And you can see it, you'll get that acceptance or failed. Uh, you can get that status, the accept or failed submission right there within the tool. If you've registered an article using the web deposit form, an XML deposit, or the OJS plugin, you can still bring that into Metadata Manager and quickly correct an article. Um, as I said earlier, you'd have to import that article into metadata, in, into metadata Manager using that add existing article feature within your journal workspace. Um, but from there, you can open it and make the change just as I have shown you how to do uh, with this example. Two other, uh, our, our reports are also a good way of discovering and kind of unearthing errors. Um, Conflicts most often occur for two reasons. Uh, the metadata registered isn't su sufficient to distinguish between two items or two or more records have the same metadata suggesting a duplicate record. So we have a conflict report um, that, we, that we send to you that flags some potential conflicts, um, which you should review from time to time. Uh, additionally, 
resolution re reports are sent out via email at the beginning of each month. Um, so you should be receiving those shortly. They include st statistics about DOI resolutions from the previous month. Uh, when a researcher clicks on a DOI link uh, of an article, that counts as one DOI resolution. And no information is captured about that specific user, but it does let us know that the, that the DOI has been clicked on or resolved. And so we report those numbers back to you. Um, a separate re report is generated for each DOI prefix, and the statistics, statistics are based on the number of DOI resolutions uh, for the previous month. And then we report those, those uh, resolutions to the contact on your account. Um, if you have a high number of failures, don't worry too much about that, um, but do pay attention. Don't panic, I should say, um, but uh, do give that some time. So prior to joining Crossref, I was with one of our member publishers. I would take 30 minutes to an hour each month to review the report, specifically the failed resolution report to see if there were any kind of themes with the failures, uh, to see if any, any DOIs that I considered to be legitimate uh, had not been registered or if there were a problem with, with any DOIs that I consider to be legitimate. As we've said throughout this, humans make errors, machines make errors. So um, I've never seen a resolution report with no failures. People are going to make, make uh, mistakes when they try to resolve your DOIs. Um, but what you want to do is spend some time with those failures and determine if there are legitimate failures, what you can do to correct them. Um, and uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to our support team. We'd be happy to guide you there. So our reports are just another uh, opportunity for us to help you catch any errors. Um, and, then, and then the resolution reports also give you an idea of how much your content is being used out in the, out in the real world. Um, if, if you have updates to the context, uh, contacts within your organization who should receive these reports, conflict reports, resolution reports, or, or any of our reports. Or if you have questions about the reports, please reach out to us at support at crossref.org. We have uh, some time for questions, and I think uh, we've got a break planned as well. Rosa? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, thanks, Isaac. Uh, thanks, Susan. So um, I see, let's take a quick five minute break. Uh, if uh, everyone would return, say at, that would be almost 1.50 Eastern Standard Time, um, that would be great. Uh, remember, you can add your questions in the Q&A box, and we will answer them during this next five-minute break. And we'll see you in five minutes. I see we have a few questions here. I know we're, we're in the middle of a break, but I'm going to go. Oh, looks like Shane's Shane's busy answering questions here. But I was going to answer a couple of questions while we while we're on break. Um, thought maybe we can do that when we get back. What do you think, Rosa and Susan? Sounds good. Okay.
Okay, welcome back. Hope you had a nice break. I'm gonna answer a, a few questions live um, that have come in in chat and in Q&A before we get started with the uh, presentation. So um, there was a question in chat for us about, the, let's see, let me read it. Um, on the monthly resolution, on the monthly resolution report, what are the res resolutions? How do how do we tell if they've been resolved or not? So I'm going to quickly share my screen and just show you what one successful resolution would be and what one failure would be. So uh, let me let me do that. Oh, um, that's going to kick you off of sharing, Susan. Uh, let me do, just do that really quickly, and then you can then you can share again. Okay. Uh, let's see. It looks like I'm sharing the right screen here. Can you see my search browser here? Yes. Okay. So what I've done is I've just grabbed uh, a, a DOI, one of our test DOIs, and so if I just resolve that, if I just emulate a click on that, this DOI, this 10.5555 uh, DOI will have one resolution next month on the report. If this DOI, if I tried to resolve a DOI that hadn't been registered, let me just change this a bit. I don't know if you can see my screen here. So you can see up here in my browser, what I'm doing is just typing in DOI.org, taking my, my DOI 10.555 and I'm gonna say, just enter, enter some information about that DOI. What you can see is this DOI is going to resolve to a DOI not found page at DOI.org. This means that this DOI has not been registered and this will count as one failed DOI and this DOI here will appear in my failure list for next month uh, on the report for 10.555. So uh, if the DOI resolves successfully, that's one for a, a successful resolution. If it fails and goes to this DOI not found page, that's a failure. And we report both of those to you in the resolution report each month. So that was the first one, first question I wanted to answer. And then there was a question about if the slides will be available. Uh, they will be, they'll be available uh, in a couple of days uh, after this. So we'll follow up uh, as a result of this. So don't feel like you have to write everything down. Uh, we will make this available to you uh, soon. Uh, the last one I wanted to answer live was a question from Biliana. Uh, it was a question about abstracts and depositing abstracts for articles. Uh, it looks like um, our colleague Shane has answered that question. In order to add abstracts to any of your deposited uh, content, you, you, can, you can do that using XML. If it's journal article content, you could also import each of those articles individually into Metadata Manager and add those abstracts that way. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a kind of a shortcut for that, so it requires a full deposit. Thanks for that answer, Shane. Um, the, other, the other questions we'll answer um, as we go, and uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Rosa. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Isaac. So um, we're going to be moving on now. Um, so let's see here. Okay, so I believe Susan will be taking over Crossref Metadata. And you can see that okay now, I shared correctly. Um, yep, I see questions in break now, so you can move your slide forward and you're up. Okie dokie. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Great. All right, thanks Rosa. Um, okay, now we're, we're gonna talk about so, metadata in a little bit more detail, um, whoops. And um, we're going to we're going to do that um, using the Crossref metadata zebra as uh, sort of a visual um, to help explain sort of where we're going with this. So a lot of people think that um, Crossref members have a defined set of metadata and that our metadata is really complete and fully comprehensive, as you can see, represented by a full zebra. However, that is not exactly um, exactly the case. This is a more of a, a better representation of what metadata is in Crossref. It's, it's missing some things, but it's, um, it's still pretty useful. You can still tell it's a zebra, um, but it's not perfect. And there's a lot of gaps in what we collect and it's not really as comprehensive as we would like. 
Unfortunately, the reality for a lot of our members is a very incomplete metadata record, a very incomplete zebra. Um, and they aren't able to send us all of the metadata that would perhaps be the best for, for their publications. Uh, they, may not, they may not collect it, they may not have it. Um, they may not be able to afford to send it to us if they're using a third party vendor that charges for um, depositing with us. Um, and they may not recognize the value of sending in particular uh, metadata items to Crossref. Um, though this is, is the goal is to collect all relevant metadata in a way that connects the members metadata to the larger scholarly uh, communication landscape. So we want to facilitate this process for all members um, using enhanced tools and reports and education um, so that members are able to send us metadata that's better connected and standardized and optimized to cite, link, and assess. And the metadata unicorn zebra is sort of what we're working towards. Um, but members don't always know what they're sending to us. So we needed a better way to easily communicate this information to them. So a couple of years back, we started work on what's called our participation reports. And these are a place, they're a tool that you can use to check what metadata that you're registering with us. They're open and they're free to use by anyone. Each member has their own report. And this allows you to see what metadata that you're sending to us. Um, you can track the levels of metadata over time. Um, and this is handy maybe if you're using a service provider um, to deposit with us or you aren't directly responsible for registering the metadata yourself. Um, it allows members to see how they measure up to other members and maybe see where there are gaps in their record. Uh, compare their records to other publishers in the same field or in the same region. So why did we create them? Well, they came about mainly because we've been hearing from members, maybe at conferences or emails, um, or on calls and meetings that they're not always sure what, member, what metadata that they are registering with us. So we decided to make it easier for them to find out. And though the data had been available for quite some time using our REST API, um, not everyone knows how to query using an API. It's not super user friendly. And it's really more geared at machines, not so much at, at, as humans, human interface, so to speak. Um, and then how can we expect someone to fix something if they're really not sure what it is that's missing from their record. But that asks the question, why is comprehensive metadata so important? Registering your content isn't just about getting a persistent identifier or a DOI for your work. It's about where your metadata goes after you register it with us and how many other organizations use that metadata to find the content that you publish. Um, because Crossref metadata is standardized and machine readable, it's very useful to a number of organizations that make your content more discoverable using their tools and services. And if you're looking at the, um, the wheel of metadata users here, as you can see a few examples, there's libraries, there's metrics and analytics, um, content hosts, um, scholarly sharing networks. These are all organizations that rely on Crossref metadata for the work that they do in the scholarly communications field. So on average, we see over 600 million metadata queries per month across all our interfaces. And this continues to increase each year. Um, this represents individuals and organizations who are trying to discover and deliver content and provide services for the research community. There's a lot of people using the data, so it's important to know what you're sending to us. And that's where the participation reports can help. So if you go to crossref.org slash members slash prep, you will come to this interface. And if you start typing in the name of your account under find member, um, it will start to populate. Um, just keep in mind that this, what you're typing in is more or less the name that would be on your invoice. So the top level account name, not necessarily an individual journal that might be under that account. So in this particular place, typing in your account name, it'll populate, you click on it. And what will come up is a participation report. Here, um, you see the main page of the report with some information about the organization. This particular example is from our member F1000 Research. At the top, you can see the name of the organization, the total number of DOIs or content registration, or content items that have registered with us. Um, and it also, what it'll show is the percentage of certain metadata elements that are deposited. And these are the elements that we consider important 
to make the content more useful and easier to discover. And these include your references, ORCID identifiers, funding and funder information, um, URLs for licenses and the similarity check service if you use that, uh, abstracts, and cost mark information if your organization uses that service. So each has a percentage show that's shown alongside, which is the percentage of deposits that contain a metadata, that metadata item. Um, you also can see on the top, um, it says um, search by title. There's a little, uh, little box at the top there. If you have multiple titles, you can run a report for each title in your account. And so you might find that different titles have different, different results. You may have different people registering the content, different editors. So it might be a good comparison to see who's registering what for which journals. So, so go in and take a look at your report. Um, sharing metadata is really important. Um, and remember that we only share your metadata and not your full text. Um, we do get questions on that occasionally. Um, and if you want to add or update metadata after looking at your report, as, as um, Isaac mentioned, there's a couple of different ways to do that using the metadata manager tool or um, updating your OJS record, um, redepositing through OJS, um, or if you use XML to resubmit an XML um, for the missing metadata. Um, our simple text query tool can be used to search and deposit references. Um, and again, funding and license information can be deposited using a CSV file. Um, if you do update um, metadata, um, the changes won't be reflected in your participation report for about 24 hours. So don't panic if you don't see the changes right away. They, they will appear eventually. I didn't go into a lot of detail in participation reports because my colleague Anna runs a monthly participation report webinar series that goes into a lot of depth on the reports, she'll go into each of those 10 items, looking at why it's, that item is important in particular, and then ways to update metadata for that particular, um, particular item. And actually there's a, um, a webinar tomorrow that she's running at 2 p.m. Eastern. So registration is still open. So if you are curious about participation reports, you might wanna jump in on that webinar and, and have a listen. Another option is to schedule a metadata health check with Anna. She'll um, so you can schedule a call with her and she'll go over your individual participation report one on one, take a look at what you're doing well, maybe what you could be doing a little bit better and then offer some suggestions on how to improve your metadata. Um, and that you can send her an email at feedback at crossref.org and um, get that scheduled if you would like. All right, next up, we are going to talk about some of the Crossref services that are available to members who are registering content with us. So one of the benefits of being a Crossref member is that you have an access to a variety of services that help re record, link, and distribute the metadata of your academic research. So Isaac and I are gonna introduce each one of these briefly and explain how they can help um, with the quality and discovery of your content. Um, and these are the four services we're gonna talk about. Reference linking, cited by similarity check, and Crossmark. And Isaac is up first with our reference linking service. Thanks. So what is reference linking? Reference linking is that connection or hyperlink between Crossref DOIs uh, when you create your citation list. This solution makes it possible for readers to follow a DOI link from the reference list of a published work to the location of the full text document on a member's publishing platform which allows uh, the community and researchers to build a network or an infrastructure that enhances scholarly communications on the web because these DOI links do not break over time. Reference linking is an obligation for Crossref members. If you're a member, you should be linking your reference list using DOIs whenever DOIs are available to you. You can see in this example on your screen from Peer J, if you hover over the link in the reference list, you can see that that link is being made by the DOI. Publishers, our, our publisher members used to sign individual agreements between each other to agree to link to each other's content. This wasn't a sustainable practice as publishing grew and grew and grew, so Crossref was formed to provide a central solution. Reference linking is accomplished by members and their production teams with the assistance of authors and editors 
who add the links to each reference in their articles. You can ask your authors to add DOIs to their reference lists or add this at copy, ed at copy editing st stage of your process. There are a number of ways to add DOIs to references, including via search engine, which is easy but slow, querying our Crossref API with XML, which is very efficient, but APIs aren't for everyone. That requires some technical skill. Um, we also have our own lookup tools, which we'll show you here shortly. Um, and also there are some third-party tools which enable this like OJS, which has launched an updated plugin, which includes reference deposits. And at Crossref, we have the metadata manager tool uh, that we talked about earlier that also allows you to deposit references. So there's, there's options available. This is our simple text query form. It allows you to match reference, reference lists to any DOIs in the Crossref system, as well as depositing them into your article metadata. You simply paste your reference list into the box and click submit. And we will bring back uh, the references plus matching DOIs so that you can add them into your reference list. You can see the blue there indicates that these, all seven of these uh, references uh, have found a match, uh, existing match uh, for our DOIs. So not all of your references will have DOIs, not all of your reference lists will return matches. Uh, if there is no DOI for a piece of work reference, there is no obligation to link it. If a piece of work is later registered with us and assigned a DOI, uh, our system automatically does checks and rechecks to make sure um, that the DOI hasn't been added later. Uh, so, so as long as you've included the, the reference, we'll do a check uh, on kind of on an ongoing rolling basis. Susan. There you are, who's unmuted, sorry. Um, okay, next up I'm gonna talk about our site advice service. Um, so researchers, as you know, they cite the work of other people to support the material that they have used when they're writing their articles. It helps to be able to see which articles are citing an article that you're reading, and then how researchers continue to develop um, their research processes. And so this is the main function of Cited by, to show the number of citations and link to the publications that cite that article. Cited by allows members to show authors and readers that other Crossref content has cited their content. So members can request the information from Crossref and then display it on their website in whatever format that they like. Um, it is a good next step once you're linking your references to look into participating in our Cited by service. Um, it's kind of like the reverse of reference linking. You can see here an example of cited by on the slide, that number 15 at the top, that's got the yellow circle around it. Um, by clicking on this list of cited by matches, you can then see items that reference the article that you're reading. This might perhaps lead you to find additional relevant research in your field. As we know, there are a lot of online citation indexing services and database, but what's different about cited by is that it lets our members display the cited by links of their content on their own website in any way that they wish. Keep in mind also that the counts, the citations that we see in Crossref may differ from other citation scores as if they're pulling the information from a different set of data. And the benefits, um, this benefits the readers of the content because they can easily get a sense of how often the content has been cited and then easily click the links to go to that citing content. And how often something is cited um, can be useful not only to publishers and authors, but to research institutions and funders as well. So if you're interested in participating, um, there's a couple of steps in the process. The first thing you need to do is to start depositing your reference with, references with Crossref if you have not already done so. This is a required step. Once you've started that process, then you're eligible to participate um, with the Cited by service. Um, you can drop an email to member at crossref.org and then ask our membership team to activate your account for the service. Once that's done, um, then you can query our system for a list of all the DOIs citing your content and then display the results on your website in whichever manner that you choose. Um, again, Cited by is an optional service and there is no fee for participating. So once your account's been enabled, 
um, for the service, you can query our system for articles, for the articles that we can see that are citing your content. And the simplest way to do this is to log into our admin system at doi.crossref.org and enter the DOI that you want to query. And this will return a list of the other articles that are citing it. Uh, for XML users, you can do the query by uploading XML files to our admin system. And again, it'll return a list of match citations. All right, next up, similarity check, which is one of our most popular services. Um, and this is a way for uh, publishers to actively engage in efforts to prevent plagiarism. And how is this done? To do this, our members are given access to Turnitin's powerful text comparison tool called Authenticate. Um, they can use this to compare their own manuscripts against the largest comparison database of full text academic content in the world. So there are, other several, there are several other plagiarism screening tools available. Um, but using Authenticate as a similarity check member is unique as it creates a relationship between content owners and Turnitin. Um, similarity check members have a reduced fee for the use of Authenticate because they contribute their own published content into Turnitin's database of full text literature. So that means as the number of similarity check members grow, so too does the size of the Authenticate uh, content database. So what's the difference now between Authenticate and Turnitin and Similarity Check? We get, we get those questions um, fairly often and it, it can be a little bit confusing. Um, so Authenticate is the software tool that's owned by the company Turnitin. Similarity Check is the name of the service which uses the Authenticate tool that's specifically offered to Crossref members. Um, it's a text-based screening service for manuscripts um, and these manuscripts are compared against content in Turnitin's uh, BAS database, which contains content from over a billion web pages, over 57 million content items from the Crossref system, and also 100 million items from other content providers uh, like Cengage, EBSCOhost, etc. So if you are interested in using the service as a similarity check member, what you would do is upload the document to Authenticate. And these can be submitted in a number of formats, including Word, text, PDF, and HTML. From there, a similarity report is produced, which shows the percentage of similarity in text between the submitted manuscript and the content existing in the database. Um, users then uh, compare the original and the database documents side by side, and editors can make a decision about whether any similarity that's detected is legitimate or if further investigation is required. When Crossref members register new content, they provide a link to their, uh, to their full text, which Turnitin uses to index the item and then add it to the database. So this is an example of a similarity report. It shows the percentage of text that's similar between the submitted document and those found in the database. Editors can review the match and then click for more information. However, it's important to note that the similarity percentage can be misleading if it's not interpreted properly. Some text may be similar, such as properly cited references or standard scientific descriptions. For example, the materials and methods uh, descriptions used in an experiment or in research. So editors can choose to exclude certain sections of text or sources or set a particular percentage threshold if they know that certain items are always coming up in their similarity reports. So what issues would a publisher be looking for when using similarity check? Um, they may be looking at some issues that can be fairly easily fixed, um, poor missing or incomplete references, self plagiarism or text recycling, which is the use of one's own previous work in another context without citing that it was actually used previously. Um, other issues are a lot more serious, and these include unattributed parts of another person's work, submitting another person's work as one's own, or attempt by an author to deliberately mislead or misrepresent. Okay, so if you want to join, there's a couple of steps that you have to follow. Members must be registering content and assigning DOIs to use the service. So if you're a new member and you don't have any content registered yet, you have to start doing that first before you can use similarity check. Additionally, one of the obligations is enabling your content to be indexed so that it can be included in the Turnitin database. And this indexing is done using um, as crawled URLs by adding as crawled URLs to the metadata 
of each content item that you're registering with us. And full text URLs must be included in at least 90% of the metadata in order to apply for the service. So a full text URL is a crawler friendly link used by crawler services to index content. And it points to the location of the full text content that can be either the PDF or the HTML version or plain text. Um, and that is associated with a particular DOI. This allows Turnitin to scan the text against submitted manuscripts. However, it does not provide outside reader access to your content. For new content, the URL, the Ascrawl URL can be included as part of the initial deposit in your metadata. For existing DOIs, you can, you can um, update the metadata deposit to include the full text URL. Um, you can check the percentage of your deposits that contain the full text URLs on uh, the services page that you see here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you would go to, uh, go to the form, type in the member name at the top. Again, that's your account name that we talked about similar in the participation reports. And if the uh, percentage of DOIs that contain the full text uh, the percentage of UIs that contain the full text URL will be displayed on the form. If the percentage is 90% or higher, then a link to the application form will be displayed. Organizations um, can review and agree to the terms as part of the application process. <coughs> Excuse me. Once your application is submitted, we'll work with Turnitin to get the account set up and we'll send out your account details. So there are two fees if you want to use the similarity check service. Crossref charges an annual administrative fee equal to 20% of the Crossref membership fee. So for example, if you pay $275 a year as a member, the admin fee for the service would be an additional $55, which is invoiced uh, along with your annual fee each January. There's also a fee for each manuscript that's checked using the Authenticate tool. So the first 100 documents that are checked are free of charge. And then after this, the fee starts at 75 cents for each of the first 5,000 documents. And the document checking fees are also invoiced annually uh, by Crossref. <coughs> uh, Isaac's up next talking about our uh, Crossmark service. Yes, I'm going to talk about Cross, Crossmark. And Crossmark is a great way for you to communicate with the, commu the scholarly community as a whole. Um, that your content is up to date. The information within your metadata is current and it, it's a way for you to build trust uh, by doing so. So uh, why is it important to update content? We talked about this a bit earlier. So, so your readers know they can trust and use your research um, so that publishers and, uh, and publishers and journals are, are the authority on this. Um, it's not bad or negative to update works. It helps to maintain the scholarly record. And this is an important job for publishers to do. After it's published, content changes quite frequently and readers need to know that those changes have been made. It could, it could be an update or a correction, um, which are quite common across uh, Crossroad membership. It's a little less common to have retractions and withdrawals, but those do happen from time to time. And it's important that those be reported uh, to, to users and to the community as a whole when they do. Um, publishers needed an easy way to communicate these changes to the readers. Uh, and we are a membership association that serves publishers. So publishers ask us to develop the solution. And so way back in 2012, we did so after a lengthy pilot and uh, we have Crossmark now. Okay. This is an example of a cross of a cross mark with no updates. Uh, the document is current. It displays a link to the publisher maintained version, which in this case is is also current. Um, below, you can see the additional publication information um, within the cross mark box there. Next, let's take a look at an example of cross mark with an update. So, clicking on the cross mark button shows that this article has had a correction made to the original version. Readers may click on the link to view further information uh, about, about that correction. And here is one with a retraction. The cross mark 
data displays the date of the retraction. Uh, the, re the reader may then click on the link uh, to provide them with further information about that retraction. Crossmark is also used by publishers to, to display additional information about a content item. So funding data, license information, ORCID IDs, and then there's custom metadata. So the, the possibilities uh, extend beyond what you see on your screen. The Crossmark box for this article, for example, contains additional information on peer review, supplemental materials, and copyright and license information. So you can see an example of how this, this member has gotten creative and expanded what is, what is available within Crossmark. So uptake, we've had over 1,000 publishers who are depositing Crossmark metadata, and that, that's nearly 12 and a half million DOIs that are, that are currently with Crossmark. Like I said, it lets readers know they can trust this content. Uh, it's convenient. It's one place to access all of this information. It works in both HTML and with a PDF. It's easier for, it's easier for researchers to cite the most recent version of content, and it's free for researchers to click on and allows more dis dissemination of your metadata. So how do you participate? You could sign up for Crossmark by contacting us and letting us know that you want to get started with the service. The next step is to create a Crossmark policy page and assign it a DOI. Create a page on your website explaining that you are participating in the Crossmark service and have committed to maintaining version of record copies of content that display the, that Crossmark button. This page should be registered and have a DOI enabled for persistence so that you have persistent linking in place. And should also explain your policies on corrections, retractions, withdrawals, and other updates. And may contain definitions and explanations of any additional custom metadata fields that are being used. The page could also include links to other relevant policies like author submission guidelines or peer review guidelines. Um, and you can learn more about the cross Crossmark policy page at um, this link, which I'll post in the chat um, so that you have it available. Uh, there it is, if you're interested in learning more about the Crossmark policy page. The third thing that needs to happen is you actually deposit the Crossmark metadata with us as part of your regular Crossmark, Crossref metadata deposit. Um, can, it can also be updated as a standalone data to populate back files. So, uh, for Crossmark only deposits, you need to see the schema and the schema documentation relating to resource only deposits. So there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Uh, again, I'm going to post a link here with more information about how to um, get started with registering updates using Crossmark. Uh, and that's that. Great. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I just want to talk briefly about a couple of community initiatives um, that are going on. So Crossmark works closely with a number of other organizations um, in the scholarly research community. And I just wanna highlight a few of these shared initiatives with you. Um, the first up is ROAR, which is the Research Organization Registry. This is a community-driven effort and it's currently being led by four steering organizations, which are California Digital Library, Crossref, DataSite, and Digital Science. Um, you can read a little bit more about the origins of the project and the activities um, in the initial working groups at roar.org. The project is aimed specifically at addressing basic and high level affiliation use cases. What organizations are affiliated with what research outputs? So why is this important? Um, there's a lot of ambiguity and variation in organizational names. You can see at the top left corner here, um, UCLA is an example. So which UCLA, UCLA might they be talking about? Is it the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine or just the UCLA School of Medicine or UCLA, or maybe it's the University of California at Los Angeles. These are all different ways that this particular institution could be represented. So it's challenging to clearly identify an organization and then properly link publications to the correct institutions. So using a ROAR ID will enable clean, consistent affiliations. So right now, affiliation metadata can be sent to us as part of your deposit. 
Um, and we're currently working on adding support for ROAR IDs in our next schema update. Another community initiative that we're involved with is Make Data Count. Crossref is a non-funded partner in this initiative. Um, and Make Data Count focuses on building the social and technical infrastructure for the development of research data metrics. Um, they recently received additional funding from the Sloan Foundation to help focus on the widespread adoption of standardized data usage and data citation practices, which are the building blocks for open research data metrics. Um, and you can see three of the aims here. Um, I won't read them out, but the second one is where Crossref's role comes into the project. Um, citing um, data and reference lists so that researchers can get credit for sharing their data. Um, more information, again, on this initiative can be found at makedatacount.org. I've been thirdly, um, Public Knowledge Project, or PKP. We've been working with them for a number of years. Um, Crossref became a PKP strategic partner um, at the end of 2019. So each year PKP holds um, a series of development sprints, which Crossref usually attends. Um, and then as a result of conversations we had at the sprint in Vancouver last spring, um, we developed and formalized a working group um, with PK PKP to meet six times a year to discuss the shared development work that we've done over time, which as you know, is the OJS plugins and some um, for deposits and then some of the additional plugins that we talked about for reference linking, for instance, um, the funding plugin. So this year, um, we began discussions about development, development work on enhancing these existing plugins, as well as the shared documentation. Um, and with also plans to develop new plugins, um, specifically for the cited by service um, and for Crossmark. So updates for those, once they sort of happen and are launched, um, you'll see on our forum, on the PKP forum, um, and there'd be announcements that come out once those are ready, uh, once those are ready to use. So I'm going to turn it back over to Rosa now to uh, wrap up today's webinar and give you a little bit of additional information. Great, thank you. Um, so I will share with you uh, where you can get uh, further help and support. So first, our community forum uh, is an opportunity to post a question for our staff, ambassadors, and other members of the Crossref community. The forum has a wide range of topics for members, including technical help, upcoming events and seminars, uh, all of our services, and information for OGS and metadata manager users. Now, for great information on how to deposit, maintain, and retrieve metadata from us, uh, information on our services uh, with technical explanation and examples, you can visit our education center and that's at crossref.org forward slash education. Uh, you can also uh, send an email to our technical staff for any queries if you cannot find the answer to your uh, query in our education documentation. You can also um, email our support or membership teams. Their email, as you can see here, is in, in the slides. Um, uh, we also have uh, pre-recorded webinars on a variety of topics, including our services and tools, and presentations uh, from previous events. Uh, please, yes, if any contacts at your organization's uh, organization changes, uh, please let us know. Just send an email. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Send an email uh, to member at crossref.org, and uh, we can update your account. And that concludes our seminar for today. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. We hope this information was helpful and you got your questions answered. Uh, so if any questions remain in the Q&A box, we will stay on to continue to answer them for another few minutes. Again, we will send out the recording and slides in a few days. Thanks again for joining us uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks all. <laughs>